Excellent. Welcome to the Metasploit team demo meeting for the middle of August already. <laughs> Thank you, Brent. Yeah, yeah, we we survived Hacker Summer Camp. Uh, up, yeah, there you go. Made it back despite ordeals. Let's talk about Metasploit framework. And let's see, we've got some cool new modules this time around to talk about. Uh, let me get my screen set up here. Uh, we'll get, let's see, community contributor Green M authored a new module for exploiting an unauthenticated code execution vulnerability in Redis, Redis 4. whatever and 5. whatever. <laughs> this module will act as a Redis server, having the target recognize it as a master, where the intention is for the master instance to pass the target commands related to data replication. But in this module's case, our rogue server will send commands to load a Redis module we've crafted, which executes our code on the target. It's pretty cool. Uh, we'll have a demo of this in our demo section. And community contributor Hoodie added a new module which targets Apache Tika, which is a toolkit that detects and extracts metadata and text from many different file types. For Windows versions 1.15 through 1.17, this module exploits a command injection vulnerability via an optical character recognition request which allows a command with parameters to be passed to the host for execution. And uh, we'll have a demo of this as well. From community contributor B. Coles comes another module targeting monitoring tool Zymon, this time for gathering server configuration information, which includes and a list of monitored hosts and associated client log for each monitored host. And for Zymon targets versions 4.25, sorry, 4.3.25 or earlier, that have the config option allow all config files set to true. This new module will also retrieve usernames and password hashes from the Zymon password config file on those targets. It's pretty neat. Community contributor Nick Trier authored a new Windows Evasion module, bypassing app locker and software restriction policies for systems using .NET version 3.5 or later. The main vector for this bypass is to use the trusted msbuild.exe binary to execute user supplied code since the msbuild binary is located within the trusted Windows directory. And our own WVU added a new module for controlling an instance of the Sonic Pi music creation and performance application on a Mac OS target, remotely executing code sequences on the target. If you'd like to see a demo of this, uh, check out the previous demo meeting from last time. Um, uh, we have a, a pretty cool demo of it. It's got a nice little Easter egg as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. yes, it does. All right, and some other interesting work going on. Pingback payloads is a new payload type. This is a new non-interactive payload type that provides users with confirmation of remote execution on the target and absolutely nothing else. No shell, no interaction, just simply proof of successful execution. Our own B Waters posted a good write-up about it on August 1st to the Rabbit7 blog site. Uh, check it out at blog.rabbit7.com. And we'll have a demo of this. Should be pretty exciting. Mm -hmm. And our own T sellers updated the Blue Keep scanner module to support a DOS action, enabling users to verify impact as well as testing of detection and mitigation controls. And T sellers also updated the uh, shuffle some code around from the Blue Keep scanner module into an RDP mix in for consolidation and reuse. Our own WVU updated payload selection for a module to support an index number, which allows you to reference. Uh, an index number that the show payload command now outputs um, and you can just do like a set payload one or set payload two. Very convenient that workflow. And WVU also added a new HTTP raw headers option to the framework HTTP client, allowing arbitrary HTTP headers to be injected into requests processed by send request CGI and send request raw and includes support for embedded Ruby templates, which is nice. Community contributor Gabriel Mioranza added a handful of Sophos AV executables to the AV HIPS executables list. Like that. And our own J. Martin pinned the vCrypt gem to a version compatible on ARM installations, as the tech broke recently. Okay. And some bug fixes. Uh, our own WVU provided a fix for an EOF error that could arise when using the Blue Keep scanner module. Community contributor Green M added a fix for a no method error crash that could occur in the Hadoop unauth exec exploit module. Contributor B. Coles added code to better handle an EOF error in the Alpha Store device manager exec aux module. B. Coles also added a fix to handle nil cases when checking if a file exists in a command shell, which is nice. Community contributor Nounish fixed output from the SMB enum shares aux module to properly display SMB share types. 
contributor H. Kerma updated the location of markdown documentation files for three modules to correctly match the actual names of those modules. Appreciate that. And our own B Waters offered a quick fix for an include which had been briefly deleted and you know, which fixed some 64 Windows reverse TCP payloads that were affected for a short window. Of time. Actually, it fixed, it fixed uh, also um, think that payloads, I believe. Nice. I like those fixes. And one more bonus slide. Uh, big thanks to everyone who was out in Vegas for DEF CON last week and stopped by our open source office hours that we held as part of our open source security meetup this year. Uh, it was great meeting y'all, hearing about what y'all been up to, hacking some code, and talking about Metasploit. And make sure to visit Rabbit's blog at rabbit7.com. We can catch up on recent framework activity via our Metasploit wrap-up blogs that post there. And you can also I mentioned that pingback payloads post that Brendan had done up there. It's good reading as well. And as always, a huge thanks to everybody who helps make Metasploit better through their contributions. Thank you. All right, let's get to the good stuff. Demos. Hey, Mr. Waters, are you on on the line? Yes, sir. I will stop my share. Okay, so pingback payloads. Uh, the idea behind this was we wanted something uh, small uh, that. All we have to do is we just send this payload to a target. The target answers back with some way to know that the exploit worked. Um, in this particular case, what we've done is we've embedded a payload with a 16-byte UUID. Uh, so it's unlikely that this is going to be, uh, you know, th there's going to be a collision given 16 bytes of entropy. Uh, in the spirit of cooking shows everywhere, I have set up a uh, an example here. Uh, in this case, we're using uh, 1710, the PS exec version, against uh, Windows 7 64 bit SP1 target. And so we'll go ahead and throw this. This is just standard as usual. You just select uh, Windows pingback as your payload. And in this particular case, my Windows machine decided to go to hibernation, so that's good. Yeah. Please stand by. Two shells work. Yes. Yeah. Well, we, we won't get a shell. Your lack of shell is important to us. Yes. Okay, this time with an actual target. Oh. Demo guys. <laughs> I'm gonna try this one more time. Can you crash your host? It looks like. Hey, there we go. <laughs> Service just hadn't started yet, even though machine booted. Yeah. Well, that's good. Four four cases to handle, right? Yeah. New payload type. I will note that, uh, that this isn't the payload's fault so far. Yeah, it's all yeah no, this is. Uh... Okay, I'm going to try something else. Uh... There we go. We're all gonna know your password. Oh no. <laughs> it's like they're the default passwords generated by uh, Baseline Builder. You're missing a one. Yep. Oh, 64 bit reverse TCP should work. Hey. Okay. So in this case, we've generated the UUID here. We've saved it to the database. Then, when the session is established, we read back that UUID coming from the payload. It matches. So we verified that we have remote execution on that target. 
and we store that to the database. Then we close the session and we move on. One thing I do want to show you is if, for example, this was a longer running uh, pen test or you wanted to continue to get pingbacks, there's also a feature called pingback retries. And so what will happen is, is you'll get the first pingback that returns with the UUID, then the payload will go to sleep for some predetermined amount of time uh, here in this pingback sleep. Then it will wake up and it will send another ping back to let you know that it's still executing on target. So hints of a possible future asynchronous s situation as well. Very cool. That would be a lot of fun to work with. One other thing to kind of note here is if you're used to using interpreters paranoid mode, um, in Mesploit 4, it used to send all the paranoid data, or basically the, the payload tracking data, to a file that you had to copy around. It wasn't saved in the database. Um, with pingback payloads, that all got migrated to the actual Metasploit database. So um, anyone who's using a paranoid mode in the past, just note that uh, it's now actually saved in the database. So if you want to share a paranoid mode connection the information, the UIDs are all in a single place for pingback and for paranoid interpreters. And so that's where it is. Cool. So uh, a quick added question is, so do, is database support or database functionality required to use the pingback payload? It is not. Uh, if the database is up and running, either the remote data service or the local database service, it'll automatically get written to the database. If that is not there, all it will do is it will report the UUID that it generated when it created the payload, and it will report the UUID in standard out when it comes back. It'll be up to you to store the UUID if you don't have a database enabled. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, so I have Apache Tika uh, 1.16 running over here. Um, yeah, so just started it, everything should be good. Uh, and for this one, the only option I had to set was the R host. The, these over here were the default already. Um, have my payload selected and everything goes as it did a few minutes ago. <laughs> should <be a> show. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we'll see the meta image jp2 coming in over here. Um, so this uh, image jp2 type is actually needed so the magic byte checks can be bypassed. Uh, so you don't have to have those magic bytes when you're kind of creating. Oh, look at that. Didn't work. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's the magic byte thing bypassed so you can actually get your payload there. Um, and what this takes advantage of is uh, quoting and the and how Windows handles um, creating the process on the command line. Um, so you could kind of add your commands uh, after a test rack check. Wow, this is. I swear it worked. I'll just <laughs> scroll up a bit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. Minutes before the demo <laughs> meeting, <laughs> this was working. Um, maybe the IP here changed now. Yeah, getting up and moving is always the worst thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll run it one, one more time. Uh, uh, do we have an idea how many projects embed Apache Tika? It seems like it's something you use to build other apps um, for content analysis. I'm not sure. Um, 231, still 231. Well, yeah, no. Target's not exploitable now. <laughs> oh, you patched it. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> we can always make exploitable for the <laughs> Yeah, I remember Buddy saying he was having some issues with the version that he was running, not with the. Um, exploit when he was using the version, uh, which is why I kind of have the three. Hey, Maxim, can you mute me? Maxim, can you mute? Thank you.
Yeah, so, so that one worked. Post production, yeah, okay. for the win. Yeah. <laughs> it looks pretty sweet. Good yeah. job. Don't know so, what went on with before, but yeah. Have you have you checked before if, it don't, if, if you can double exploit the service? Uh, well, we could, yeah. Because you didn't cancel the service before starting. Well, we'll, we'll check right now. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it works. I've run it like three times before. I don't know what the issue was before. Um, yeah, any questions while this is slowly uploading? <laughs> oh, there we go. Yeah. Uh, is there a check method? I, I guess there, there was for like that. Oh, yeah. Built yeah. right into it. Um, so check target is vulnerable. Sweet. Uh, which there's um, actually something I had to slightly modify for the check to work. Um, over here, if I scroll back, there's something mentioned. Uh, so this thing about handling like the welcome for HTML. Um, basically, when you start the service, you could get a, a page, and then you start it again, you could get a different page. So it kind of swaps between, between which welcome page is shown. Um, so originally the check only had um, a method to extract the version number from one of those pages. Uh, and yeah, I was having an issue with that before, but that's fixed now. So it should, should work. Um, any other questions? No, I, I'm, I'm, I've been reading the Fetch website just now, and they have so many plugins and files formats that they parse. It's a um, nice attack surface for sure. <laughs> Very <laughs> interesting. Awesome. Thanks, Jacob. Yeah, thank you, Jacob. All right. So uh, similar to the, the cooking shows uh, that Brendan mentioned a minute ago, I like to have stuff kind of ready to go. And so uh, in this case, uh, the, uh, the module itself and the documentation, there's instructions on how you can pull a uh, Docker instance of a vulnerable Redis. Very convenient. Took like seconds to set up. So we have Redis running locally in a Ubuntu VM here, a Docker container up in an Ubuntu VM. And we'll start the console here. <clears throat> Give this just a second to, to spin up. There's a there's a handful of options that we we have to set on this one since it, in this case it's it is running in a Docker container. This is a slightly contrived case of I'm um, running everything locally in one spot. Uh, you, you know, usually your target likely would be elsewhere, but it could be local. Um, but this will definitely showcase the the mechanisms here. So the first thing we want to do is we want to use the the new module. It's called Redis Unauth Exec. And here we can look at the options. And uh, it has a, you know, a few options, our host being the target. Uh, in this case, we want to set our host to, we have a, the port forwarded, scroll back up here. Uh, we forwarded port 6379 from inside the Docker container to the host OS. And so now we've got we've set up our, our host option there. We also need to set up our server host, which is the rogue quote unquote server, Redis server will be running to allow ourselves to identify as a master Redis server to the target. We also need a port for that service to run on. Uh, anything that's not in use is fine. And last but not least, we need to tell the payload where to where the call back to. It's going to see here, it's a reverse TCP payload. And with that, should be set up to run. So in this case, you can see that there's, there's a bit of output here about the rogue server uh, running, closing, uh, stage being sent. So in this case, instead of our server, it, it, Redis says, sets all this up so that the master server can pass down replication commands directly to the target to say, I need you to do these things to replicate the data from me or here to there. Uh, instead of that, we're saying, hey, why don't you load this module? It's really cool and run it. And so the target loads the module and runs it. This gives us a session here that should show us like a, a Debian 10. Um, so that is, that's, that's that really. 
that for Linux, you have an option of compiling a payload uh, for exploitation. It looks like it's set to true by default. Uh, there is a pre-compiled module uh, that you can also use. Uh, I've only tried it against the Linux target uh, myself. But, yeah. A quick question. Yeah. Um, there are about 10,000 Redis servers just on the internet right now. I just kind of did a quick check. Um, would this be remotely exploitable given the fact that you have to sort of trick the, the slave into talking to a master uh, kind of accepting one? Um, or is this something that requires probably like an inside sort of connection? I don't know that it actually requires. So caveat is I know very little about Redis other than mm -hmm. it's been used in a number of places at work, but I never had to work on it directly. So it, it, it would the write-up I read off of a Russian website this morning uh, <laughs> made it sound like that it was, and you correct me if you know better, it made, made it sound like that it, as long as you could contact the, the server that you could trick it. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Okay, so you can find a non-master non -master already out there. Right, and as long as you can reach it and, and have it reach back to you, and you can you can tell it that you're the server, and it'll let us go ahead and keep going. So Nice. Um, again, that was kind of a crash course I had this morning, but... Uh, yeah, I thought it was a really interesting module and everybody likes unauthenticated code execution. So I'll show that. Any questions? Going once. Is it, was there a check method on this module too? Um, that is a good question. I believe there is. Sweet. Yeah, there is. Yes. So yay, we like check methods. Mm -hmm. Super cool. Excellent.